The next one, shaking versus stirring. This is another big one. Um, I get this all the time. As a general rule, you should shake all cloudy drinks and you should stir all clear drinks. And this is from bartending for dummies. So, all right, a lot of people have heard that. And I know a lot of people that kind of live and die by that. I wanted to go ahead and see what the actual effects of shaking versus stirring was, again, on the temperature and also on the dilution of the drink. So, hypothesis, stirring a martini will chill it at a rate equal to shaking and the drink will return to room temperature at an equal rate after service. So essentially they both do the same thing to the drink, shaking versus stirring. That's sort of the assumption out there. So here's our independent variables. Mixing method, that's what we actually changed. Dependent variable is the initial temperature of the drink just prior to service and the temperature of the drink at any given time x. We controlled for mixing time, drink volume, and then all the other normal stuff that we control for. Now this one, I want you guys to actually watch this because we got some cool stuff going on here. So we set up a magnetic stirrer, which you've already seen us use. So that's going to give us constant stirring uh, characteristics. There's going to be no variability in stirring between, between runs, which is really important. So then for the shaking part, I had to figure out, well, what's a good way to simulate shaking consistently time after time after time? And I have to thank Dave for this one. Um, and what we came up with is a paint shaker. Nicole is going to stir the drink in the mechanical, uh, the magnetic stir, and Dave is going to shake the drink in the paint shaker. So you can see exactly how I ran these experiments. You guys about ready to get started on that? Now, when I actually ran these experiments, we very carefully controlled for time to make sure that they started and stopped at the exact same time, temperatures were all the same, that kind of good stuff. I'm just going to let them get set, and when you guys are ready, you just let me know. We have an ambient one as well. Right, the control that we used is the drink just on ice for 60 seconds with no agitation at all. No agitation at all. So 60 seconds is when we're going. You guys take over. Okay, so you can see we got shaking going on over there, we got stirring going on over here, and then we have the ambient. And I'm gonna let them run this for 60 seconds. I just think that thing's so cool. Yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna like put this in every bar that I open for now. I'm gonna have paint shakers. And the only thing you gotta be careful is it tends to like really kind of weld the shaker together. <laughs> so I went through about nine shakers and finally found one that that actually works. Um, but it gives great results in the tin frost and it's really, really fantastic. Um, now the other thing that I did is I checked the dilution or the concentration rather of the drink before exposure to ice and then we check the concentration of the drink after exposure to ice so we can see what the dilution rates, what happened to the dilution rates on both of those were. All right, so here's what we're getting, shaking versus stirring. Top is the control. That is just a drink sitting on ice for 60 seconds. You can see, not bad. The drink actually goes down to about 48 degrees. Shaking and stirring actually take the drink down to almost the exact same temperature as the hypothesis suggested. They take the drink down to about 37 and a half degrees. Now look what happens after. The green line is shaken and the pink line is stirred. Not too big a difference. And I went ahead and graphed our deltas. I'm gonna to get to that in a second. Not too big a difference. Pretty comparable to what we saw with the chilled ice. And what you actually find out is that the delta at any given time between shaking and stirring, and when I say delta, I mean change in temperature, is about two degrees. So shaking is gonna make the drink about two degrees colder than stirring the drink. And we know that chilling a martini glass is gonna make the drink about three degrees colder than not chilling the martini glass. So we got a couple different ways to achieve the same result there, and we have ways to magnify both of those results. So shaking into a chilled martini glass is gonna give you what's the de delta gonna be? Five, right? So we, we've made both of those methods a little better. But here's the really, really interesting thing. And again, I have to thank my professional scientist friend to my right for pointing this out as I was analyzing the data. I want you to look at that first minute from minute one to minute two and see how the, the lines cross. Do you know what that indicates? Do I have any chefs in the room, anybody who cooks or just drinkers? What happens <laughs> when you take a, a pot roast, let's say, or a big piece of steak out of the oven? Carry over cooking. Thank, that's the word. Carry over cooking, right? Latent cooking sometimes it's called, right? It continues to cook 
after it comes out of the oven. And you have to allow for that. Because if you want a medium rare piece of steak and you take it out at medium rare, by the time you serve it, it's gonna be medium. It's gonna keep cooking. What's really cool about this is that happens with shaking. You can see that between minute one and minute two, the shake and drink actually continues to get colder. The stirred drink does not. That's, I think, what people assume happens with a chilled martini glass, and we didn't see that. With shaking your drink, it does. And my theory is that it's because of the chipped ice, right? The chipped ice in the glass continues to cool the glass, right? So I want you to remember that also because we're going to come back to that. Now, here's our dilution rates, and you can see that for the dilution of just sitting on ice, it goes from about 40 degrees down, 40% uh, down to about 38%, and we get maybe about 7 or 8% additional dilution with shaking and stirring both. Now, one of the things I want to blow out of the water right now, and I didn't do any experiments for this, this is just me telling you as a bartender that dilution is not a bad thing. Okay, dilution is not a bad thing. And any scotch drinkers will tell you, if you go to do a, a tasting at a distillery, for example, one of the first things that they're gonna give you as they give you that taste of their product that they've spent the last six years making, they give you a flask of very pure water and a medicine dropper so that you can add water to the sample so it can open up. And as bartenders, one of the things that we try and do in addition to chilling the drink and mixing the drink is get that dilution to happen. All right, because your tongue can't taste things at a, above a certain alcohol percentage. And at most drinks that come out of the bottle at about 40% or 80 proof, it's too strong for most people to taste. So if there's anyone in the audience, this is the golden nail that's coming around, if there's anyone in the audience that has trouble drinking scotch, whiskey, bourbon, rye, and wants to start appreciating them a little bit more, and has been drinking them straight, don't. Don't kill yourself. Add some water, add straight water, add some ice, let it melt, shake the crap out of it, whatever you gotta do. Get that dilution rate down to the high 20s. And then your tongue will turn back on, you'll be able to enjoy that cocktail. All right, so that's really kind of important for a couple different reasons. How are we doing on the uh, distillation, Dave? 80 degrees. All right, great. We getting samples? We're getting samples. Fantastic, good. That's looking really, really good. All right, so in conclusion, James Bond was in fact correct. Shaken, not stirred is still my preferred way to serve a martini. So stirring, again, stirring a martini will chill it at a rate slower than shaking and the drink will return to room service at a faster rate after service. So the null hypothesis is rejected here. So the average drink temperature is reduced by about two degrees and that represents about three minutes of additional drink time, about three minutes of additional drink time. Rate of temperature is comparable, but this last bullet point, again, is really, really important to me. The shake and drink maintains slash reduces the initial drink temperature for about three minutes after it's done coming out of the shaker.